Welcome back to another instalment of New Zealand's Bird of the Week, where in this video I will be talking about the Black Robin, birds endemic to the Chatham Islands that are, conservation-wise, world famous for their inspiring recovery from imminent extinction in the early 1980s. I hope you enjoy. Black Robins are small birds, endemic to the Chatham Islands, currently today being confined to the southern extremity of their former range. They are rotund, and intermediate in size and form, between their close relatives, the New Zealand tomtits and robin, at around 15cm in length and weighing up to 25 grams, with both sexes being completely black at all ages. A member of the Petroicidae family of Australopapelon robins that are found throughout Australasia and the Western Pacific, it has been found that instead of being a derivative of the New Zealand robin, through genetic evidence, it has been found that they group more strongly with the tomtits, indicating that lineage sorting and or introgressive hybridisation may have occurred. They are wholly insectivorous, foraging in leaf litter for grubs, wetter and worms, with them also being able to hunt both during the day and night due to their decent night vision. They do differ in their feeding habits from mainland robins and tomtits, in that they do not cache their food for later. They live in and prefer low-altitude scrub forest remnants, with water and open spaces heavily restricting their movement, meaning that the colonising of detached habitat is slow, and natural migration between the various Chatham Islands is not known to occur. Birds breed annually in spring and summer, with a cup-like nest being built either in tree cavities or in dense shrubs and vines, usually within two metres off of the ground. They have a patriarchal social system based on territories, which are defended aggressively during their breeding season, with birds being monogamous. Many of their clutches comprise of two eggs, with only the female incubating, although both birds care for the young after hatching. They make a long-term parental investment in their few offspring, typical of the slow breeding strategies of temperate southern hemisphere birds. The reproductive output is noted for black robins to be the lowest recorded among the Australasian robins due to their small clutch sizes and long breeding cycle, with the latter also being shortened climatically. Male birds live to around 4.2 years on average, slightly longer than females, 3.7, although a few exceptions have been noted, one of them being a notable individual who will be covered later on in the video. Their song has a limited range of calls, with the males mainly performing it, consisting generally of four to five clear notes, with it not being as rich or melodic as the calls of mainland birds. Birds are also territorial, with males patrolling and defending their areas, with females having also been observed chasing away other females. By the time Europeans had arrived on the Chatham Islands, the birds were still relatively widespread, but in the now all too familiar pattern of human colonisation, through pest and land clearance, their numbers dwindled until they had become restricted to the bleak and tiny islands of Little Mangaroo, with the estimated remaining population of about 20 birds surviving in a clump of forest no bigger than 5 hectares. A very precarious position indeed. Here, they struggled with their limited habitats, with their numbers by 1972 being about 18 individuals strong, and then by 1976 down to just seven, including two females facing by all accounts a certain trajectory to extinction. The predicaments the population faced around this time would however lead to one of the most astounding conservation efforts, one that's with ingenuity and understanding of the birds as a whole, managed to bring them back from the brink. In a bid to save the species, conservationist Don Merson, who had made his first trip to the Chassams back in 1968 and seeing the robins for the first time, then numbering about 30 birds, set out alongside others in the New Zealand Wildlife Service, later to become the Department of Conservation, considered where and how they could safely transfer some breeding pairs to another predator-free island to help spread the risk in case of a predator invasion, disease or weather event. To prepare for this, they needed to learn more about the black robins and their behaviour, and how to most effectively translocate them. The team that would later set out to monitor them practice with the more common mainland birds, and discovers, like many other New Zealand birds, were very tolerant of disturbances at their nest, with them then practicing transferring them over short distances as they modified the design of their robin travel boxes. Don led an expedition to the Chassams in 1972, rowing his team across a short 100 metre stretch of rough water between Mangaree and Little Mangaree Islands in Anoles and Bassas, 3 metre long aluminium dinghy with a small hole in the bottom, certainly not the most secure of transports. A small fountain of water even spelt his out of the hole, and no one on the dinghy had life jackets on hand, but luck was with them, and they managed to cross back and forth without any serious mishaps. 
The team caught and banded as many black robins as they could find, mimicking their calls using mist nets and food lures to bring them in. The team needed to establish a new population to ensure their continued survival. The issue was as to where. Mangaree Island, the main contender, was the closest as mentioned to being around 100 metres away across the ocean, although it was also small and the robins would also have to compete with the related tomtits for food. Rangatira Island, while also being much larger, also had tomtits, and the thought of whether they could even find one another in this larger environment was also a noted risk. Merton and his team returned to the Chassams again in 1973, with birds being counted once again, but the news was grim. Since they'd last counted 26 birds the year earlier, there has been a very severe winter and dry summer, with four of their nine banded birds having disappeared, and the team could only assume the same population of unbanded birds had probably been lost as well. For the next three years, Don Merson was fully involved in working to save the Kakapo, which were also in a precarious position, and so others in the Wildlife Service continued to study and monitor the robins. In 1974, there were 12 adult birds, a year later, just 11. Each year, the number of chicks successfully raised barely managed to replace the adults that were lost, with the tiny forests remaining on Little Mangaroo also rapidly deteriorating due to salt and wing damage reaching into the habitats after petrol colony disturbance through a helicopter site being cleared on the island to better access a booming crayfish industry alongside mutton birding. The constant treks and burrowing by petrels created a rich litter of nutrients, something which greatly supported the insects that the robins regularly ate, and with their decline, it meant that the robins also suffered. In the August of 1976, Merton, while on Maud Island checking up on Kakapo, got an urgent call from his Wellington bosses, and that he was needed for a black robin transfer trip, which was happening in just a few weeks' time. The following month, Merton and his team finally had the chance and the go-ahead to translocate the birds to Mangaree Island, something which was overruled previously. Mangaree Island, in the meantime, had gone through some restoration and planting, with 80,000 flax and shrubs being planted on the islands between 1973 and 1979, allowing for more birds to be potentially supported. Upon returning to the island, the team could only find seven individuals, with only two of them being females. Initially, the team had been authorised to transfer just one breeding pair to Mangaroo, but with only two females left on the island, the situation was desperate, and so they decided to risk the moving of the second female as well, one of them being named Blue after their leg band, who would go on to be a key player in their recovery. The remaining birds were captured and placed into boxes for transport, with them then being collected and retrieved through the use of specially made 5 metre ladders attached to Little Mangaroo's cliffs, alongside fixed ropes to aid in climbing. Considering the 200 metre drop, and the fact that the boxes were strapped onto the conservationist bags, any slip-up would cost not only their lives, but an entire species. The birds were subsequently moved to Mangaroo, and by 1979 the population had further dwindled to just five individuals, including now just one single breeding pair. Their births had not managed to outpace the deaths, with the previously mentioned Blue, now named Old Blue due to their age, being the only adult female, with the rest of the population consisting of another female, although a juvenile, Old Green, who became an adult in the 1981 breeding season, alongside her mates White and Old Yellow, Old Blue's partner, and the previous year's chick, lays by the lesser pair. Things looked up when Old Green nested and laid two eggs, with one managing to hatch, and so the population once again rose to seven. However, Old Blue's fledgling dies early in its life, and Old Green's chick had vanished, more than likely eaten by a predator, with their second egg going cold after a stormy night. At this point, Don Merson and his team could have very easily have given up due to the sheer task ahead of them of trying to restore such a seemingly doomed species. But, through determination and willingness to see their work pay off, they kept at it, and in turn made some key observations that could turn the situation around. Don and his team noted that Old Green began work on a new nest soon after the cold egg was removed, with something similar being noticed with Old Blue and Old Yellow. This evidence that black robins will indeed re-nest if disturbed was a key piece of information that the team desperately needed, and so they set about formulating their plans for the next breeding season. If Don and his team could remove the eggs and put them under another species of birds, it was theorised that through the stirring step of cross-fostering, the first of its kind done in the wild, that the birds would continually re-nest, boosting productivity. With it already being established, as mentioned earlier, that New Zealand robins were tolerant to nest disturbance. The team set out in collecting their eggs, 
and with no access to flash incubators as we do today, they transferred eggs and whole nests across the islands on and in Heath's tins of corned beef. Together with his two older brothers, Moosin had experience in doing similar fostering work in successfully fostering an orphaned wild goldfinch nestling to the grandmother's canary, something that would be put to the test with what remains of the rarest known bird species. The stakes could scarcely be higher. Old Blue was already eight years old, and in a species that only generally lived for four, the time to save them was paramount, considering that Old Green's eggs and chicks had consistently either been infertile or didn't survive for long. The team moved their clutches of eggs, sometimes two times, with the birds given the chance to raise their third clutch, meaning their productivity could very well be improved by up to three times if the chicks managed to survive. The team first tried out Chasm Island warblers, and at first, all seemed well, with the warblers feeding the chicks, although with around 11 days old, they were found dead, with the nest being felled by droppings. So while they could successfully incubate robin eggs and rear the chicks, they couldn't raise them to a fledgling age. The choice was then made to try out tomtits on nearby Rangatira Island, with eggs being transferred 15 kilometres by sea, where the birds were present in the summer of 1981 through 82, and with warblers on standby as a backup option to incubate eggs or to raise chicks for the first few days only. This idea proved to be the breakthrough the team had been hoping for, with three of Old Blue's chicks being successfully reared by the tomtits and then being taken back to Mangaroo. Blue also successfully raised another two eggs to fledging. Old Green, on the other hand, consistently faced setbacks, with eggs either not hatching and chicks not surviving, with red mites infesting their nest being one possible cause. By the summer's end in 1982, the population had increased to 12 birds, with all five chicks that year being born through Old Blue and Yellow, with the team also providing the young fledglings with food to give them a better chance of survival. An issue was however noted in that some of the chicks reared by tomtits either showed no interest in mating with other robins or wanted to instead pair up with their foster species, and so to avoid this issue, the team synchronised the hatching dates to unite robin broods of the same age, with their nests being made larger to accommodate more chicks. Another interesting issue that arose however would present itself in regards to the species' careful management that's well necessary in the short term to prevent their extinction led to some unintended consequences. They noted that many female birds lay their eggs on the rims of their nests, rather than the centre. Precarious positioning aside, these rim eggs were never incubated and rarely, if ever, hatched, and given that every egg at the time was precious considering their population, the team repositioned the ones on the rims back to the centre to increase the chances of a population rise. Of course, if left alone, the rim egg lying birds would struggle to pass on their genes, as their eggs would rarely survive, and so by meddling with this process, Don and his team unwittingly allowed the rim egg lying genes to spread throughout the population, allowing for the survival of the quote unquote not so fit. How this passed on was determined through an analysis that traced itself back to Old Yellow, who appears to be a silent carrier of the dominant allele, all genetic traits for the behaviour meaning that half of his female offspring were likely to continue this behaviour due to it seeming to be a maladaptive, dominant trait. Once the scientists realised what had happened, they stopped the moving of the rim eggs by 1990, both for this reason and that robin numbers had to continue to increase to more promising and less immediately dire levels. Since then, the behaviour is as it was before, naturally selected against, and as a result, only 9% of females today exhibits this rim nest behaviour. The allele, however, still persists as the dominance trait that's well being expressed in females is seemingly hidden from selection in male birds. If the team has continued to move the rim eggs, birds could very well have become reliant on people for their survival, something that has been noticed in the case of the domesticated silkworm Bombyx moru. Over the course of 5,000 years of living alongside people, this species ended up not only increasing their cocoon size, body size, growth rates, as well as tolerance to human presence and handling, but also losing their ability to fly, meaning they need active human assistance in finding a mate. They also lack the fear of potential predators, and have also lost their native colour pigments, since camouflage is now no longer relevant for them. While an extreme example, it shows that if says egg movement continues, robins may well have become dependent on people for their survival, and thankfully avoided such a fate. The goal of conservation is, after all, not just to save a species temporarily, but to create a wild population that can sustain itself without further human assistance. As their breeding continues, Old Green continue to lose offspring, and eventually, its result is in all of Old Green's genes being lost, leading to Old Blue alongside a partner, Old Yellow, 
who was not partner-uptable with Old Green, even when Old Boy was moved to Rangatira Islands in 1983 in the hope that they would mate, being the sole two ancestors for all currently living Black Robins. As such, all Robins alive today are descended from this single pair, creating one of, if not the most extreme population bottlenecks possible or even known of. However, this does not seem to have caused any noticeable inbreeding problems, leading to speculation that the species had passed through several such population reductions in its evolutionary past, and had lost any alleles that could cause deleterious inbreeding effects, as would otherwise be expected. It was generally assumed that the minimum viable population protecting from inbreeding depression was around 50 individuals, but this is now known to be an inexact average, with the actual numbers being below 10 in rapidly reproducing small island species like the robins, to several hundreds in the case of longer-lived animals with wider distributions like elephants or tigers. Old Blue, after a move to Rangatira, continued to survive well with her last being observed on the 13th of December 1983, and afterwards never being seen again. What was unusual was that Old Blue managed to survive a miraculous 13 to potentially 14 years of age, something very unusual considering birds from what the team observes rarely lives any longer than 4 or 5. There were even calls and a high level proposal to take and preserve her as a stuffed specimen, wishing to showcase her importance, although this was never done and so Old Blue continued to live out her days in her native habitat, living a life that, while typical for many of her kind, was involved in exceptional circumstances, where her persistence and long life allows her and the species as a whole to beat the odds, and that is most definitely something to be commended. Her long life allowed for Don Merson and his team to continue to raise her and Old Yellow's chicks, something which could have never happened if she lived the average four to five years. Today, as of October 2020, the population totals around 298, with around 264 on Rangatira and 34 on Mangaroo, and all thanks to the work of Old Blue and Don Merton's team. While their recovery has been amazing to see, birds still require extensive monitoring, as well as potential reintroductions. The Mangaroo Island population has been noted to be declining, with less juveniles than usual being noses, although the reasons are not yet known and reminds us that complacency in conservation can be another issue itself. Black robins appear to be more extinction prone in general when compared to their relatives, with their lower reproductive outputs, more specialised forest dwelling and foraging habits, narrow tolerances to habitats and quality, alongside their limited power of dispersal due to their reduced flight capabilities all being notable factors. As an example, attempts were made to establish another population in a fenced region on Piss Island, although they failed likely due to competition for foods with introduced mice. Introduced common starlings are also the most common cause of nesting failure for the robins on Rangatira, with almost 21% of nests failing due to them, with said incidents being more common when they nested in cavities compared to open nests. Ongoing restoration of habitats and the eradication of introduced predators is therefore crucial in allowing them to be introduced to the other islands in the Chasm Islands, not only to Piz and the main Chasm Islands, but also to where the conservation story began, back on Little Mangaroo. The fostering program used for the Black Robin has been used as a case model on how to save endangered birds around the world, and it really is remarkable too for just how much did not go right. The first fostering experiments failed, desperately needed chicks and eggs were eaten or infertile, males courting the wrong females or refusing to feed their mates, boats capsizing, crushed fingers and generators dying and being replaced with makeshift windmills cut out of wildlife service signs. And yet, it worked out in the end, showing us that we must never give up hope, and that even when all seems lost, even the most insurmountable tasks can become possible with innovation and persistence. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of New Zealand's Bird of the Week. For next time, you are now able to vote for the Hutton Shearwater, one of the few seabirds that still breed solely on the mainland. With that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.